I think this is going to be a really good one. Let me uh, just really quick uh, talk to you real about our uh, presenters. Uh, we've got Natalie Umflett and Warren Petty, both from the High Plains Regional Climate Center today. Um, let's see. Natalie's a regional climatologist with the High Plains uh, Climate Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. She's helped design many of the web tools available from HPRCC, some of which we're going to be learning about today. Uh, she's a PhD candidate uh, in natural resources sciences at UNL. And uh, interesting fact, she's hiked to the top of 28 states. Uh, the last high point was New Jersey, and she's headed out to New Mexico to do Wheeler Peak this summer. So that's kind of cool. And then our co-presenter is Warren Petty. He also works at High Plains Regional Climate Center, but he's working remotely out of Greensboro, North Carolina, where he's joining us today. Uh, he develops web applications and does product generation software for the center. He's responsible for developing the ACES maps and ACES GIS. Um, he's also developed the tribal dashboards and Climate for Cities tools that you can see on the website at HPRCC. Uh, he's got a master's in meteorology from UNC Char Charlotte. And uh, interesting fact about him, he's a private pilot. Before moving to Lincoln, Lincoln, he spent most of his time flying around North Carolina and helping his father with uh, aircraft maintenance. So that's a little bit about our speakers. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to press, uh, press on and hand it over to Natalie, and she could begin the presentation today. All right. Thanks so much, Glenn. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. I know some of us uh, here in the central region is our lunch hour, so maybe uh, maybe that works out pretty well here. So I'm just going to get my screen uh, shared, make sure everybody can see that, and I'll get started. So as Glenn mentioned, Warren and I will be talking about some of the ways that you can utilize ACES in your website. And you know, AASC membership is fluid, and we have people who come and go, and we have a mix of folks on the line today and a mix of folks who's going to be watching. So we'll be going over some basic and advanced ways to incorporate ACES and ACES-based products into your website. So whether you are new to ACES or maybe you're a seasoned ACES user, we hope that by the end of the webinar, you will leave knowing a little bit more than you did before and that you are inspired to start using ACES. So let's get started. For those of you who might be newer to uh, AASC and maybe not familiar with the Regional Climate Center program, always have to include this map here. Um, so Warren and I are from the High Plains Regional Climate Center. We're housed at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We are in extremely good company. So we're in the same building as the National Drought Mitigation Center and the Nebraska State Climate Office. And we cover the states in purple. So you can see there that's Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Colorado, and Wyoming. And along with our sister centers that you can see there on the map, we collectively cover the entire country. And we um, do that with the purpose of providing climate data and information to the public for decision making. And so at the heart of everything that we do is data. And chances are, if you have ever worked with climate data, you have been impacted by the regional climate centers, whether you knew it or not. So for instance, if, um, if you work with co-op data, you've interacted with the Western Regional Climate Center. So all the co-op data entry is run through what's called Weather Coder, and that's managed by their center. Or if you've ever run into errors, maybe in the co-op data, um, and you want to work to get that corrected, there's an error reporting system called Datzilla, and that's run through the Southern Regional Climate Center. Or maybe you're one of those folks out there that answers a lot of questions, maybe from the media or the general public, and you want to talk to them about extremes. Well, it's the Northeast Regional Climate Center that helps put together the threaded product products that you have in, uh, in interfaces such as XMASIS or SDASIS. There's a lot of different ways that you've probably interacted with the regional climate centers, even if you didn't know it. We also have um, you know, a lot of other products. So this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of data and information and services that we provide as a program. 
And one service was developed especially for state climatologists, and that's called SCASIS. And I know that most of you on the line or listening um, later on in the webinar are probably already aware of this tool, but I know we do have some new folks to the crowd, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that this resource exists for them. And so SCASIS provides a very easy way to interact with climate data and provide information to your users. And so uh, this tool integrates data from multiple sources or all across the country. So it doesn't matter what state you're in or what region, you can use this tool. And you can use it to help answer questions very quickly. Um, you can grab data, you can do data analyses. Um, when I have demoed this tool to different groups, uh, people's eyes get very big because they realize that they could save a lot of time utilizing this tool instead of downloading the data and processing it themselves in you know, a spreadsheet or R, something like that. So very easy to use, very user-friendly. Highly recommend it if you haven't used it. Um, and so this is called SCASIS, and SCASIS is built off of what is called ACES, the Applied Climate Information System. And ACES is just a framework that helps people utilize data, okay? And so at the Regional Climate Center program, ACES is built to manage that flow of information from data collectors to the end users. So how do we take all the observations that are coming in through co-op, through co raws, through airport stations, et cetera, and turn that into information that people can digest and use very quickly, okay? And so ACES is way we do that and it helps just make things a lot easier. It helps to, uh, we manage the data so that you don't have to, okay? And so you've probably all seen these maps. This is probably one way that most people interact with ACES. It's an ACES-based product. And there's a lot of different ways that you can interact with ACES, okay? So you can use an interface like SC ACES, like what I described before. Um, that's built off of the ACES framework. We have different interfaces available out there that do similar things like Climod. So that's kind of for the general public. We also have XM ACES, which is for the National Weather Service. We have Ag ACES, which is for the USDA. And they're all different ways to interact with the data. The nice thing about this is that um, you can make, you can pull data, you can make graphs, you can make charts, you can even make maps. It's very user friendly. And I said before, this is very easy to use and I put beginner level here, but that does not necessarily mean that the tool is not powerful. Um, I know that I use this tool on a daily basis for a whole range of applications, but it's just very user friendly. So anybody could go in and start working with SC ACES um, with no prior knowledge of climate data um, at all. So you could teach uh, you know, you could teach middle schoolers how to do it and they could probably make some really beautiful maps and graphs and charts in a matter of minutes. Um, but you can also interact with ACES on other, in, on other levels. So we also have data available in GIS formats. And so, for instance, you can download shapefile versions of the HPRCC's climate summary maps. Um, and that's so that you can make custom maps for your own region or sector. And I say that this is kind of at an intermediate level. Not that it's hard, but you do need knowledge of GIS software, whether you're using ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, you're going to need some knowledge of that in order to make this work. But with those skills, this is a relatively straightforward process. And so we've got a little screenshot here of our GIS portal. And so you can see on there, you can actually download each individual file. You can import that into your GIS software and you can make your custom map. Or you can connect your software to our portal through a geo server. So if you want to make maps on a regular basis, what you can do is you can connect that and then the data in your, in your software will update on a regular basis. Sounds like we've got maybe somebody um, unmuted there. We could maybe uh, try to mute folks. Glenn, would that be okay? Okay. 
Well, we'll try to uh, we'll work through it. So, uh, we also have, uh, you can interact directly with ACES through ACES Web Services. And through ACES Web Services, you have access to historical, near real time, and projected daily data. So you have access to everything that's, that's contained within it. And this is more on the advanced end of the spectrum. And that's because you do need coding skills in order to utilize it. But that's not to discourage anybody. There are lots of resources available to get you started if you are interested in using it. Um, and so this is just a screenshot here of our documentation for web services um, on our rcc-aces.org page. We do have extensive documentation of web services to help you get started and you can understand what sort of data sets are available within that. Um, and we have links to tutorials to help get you started. So there's a lot there to digest, but um, we do make it uh, pretty user friendly um, if you got the coding skills to get started there. Um, so what I wanna do now is show some examples of how people are using ACES. So um, we've seen little screenshots of like SC ACES, um, things like that. But how are people using it? What organizations are using it? Um, there's a lot out there. So I thought I would highlight some of those. So first up is the Alaska Climate Research Center, which is home to the Alaska State Climatologist. And what they have is a daily, daily data lister, which is pictured here. So what a person can do is they can come to the site they can select a station in Alaska and they can grab the data they need. And so for instance, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse here, um, you can select these different um, choices here and you can build your table of data that you need. So in this, uh, in this example, I chose Alaska and I decided that I want max, mean and min temperature, precipitation, snowfall and snow depth. And then that gives me a table below. But if I wanted to also choose cooling degree days and heating degree days, I could have selected those and it would just expand that table out further. So this is a really nice example of how you can use ACES to do a custom uh, daily data lister. There are other places that utilize ACES to do this sort of work. So I know that Colorado has a data lister, Minnesota does. Um, there could be others out there, those are just a couple off the top of my head, but this is a very um, easy way to utilize ACES to get data out to your users. Now, if you wanna take that data lister idea a little further, this is a nice tool that comes from the office of the New Jersey State Climatologist. And here, what you can do is select a station and a variable, and this will retrieve all the monthly data for that location, but with a twist. So here in the table, you can see that certain cells are color coded. And this indicates if you have a record or if you rank in the top or bottom for each individual month. And so what this tool does is it takes that data, adds a historical perspective so that you can easily see um, where different months rank. And there are also, um, so those are a couple of statewide examples. Um, we could probably fill a whole webinar with all the examples of tools out there, but I wanted to show those because I thought they were really neat. Um, but we do have, you know, regional and national tools uh, that utilize ACES. And many of them are used for drought monitoring and risk assessment. So here we have a tool from the SKIP RISA, and this tool helps to put precipitation into historical perspective. And so you can see here they have data displayed in several ways. So they have um, they have a table here that's got 30 day precip, um, not just the precip values, but also departure from normal, percent of normal, how that ranks. So it's giving you that historical perspective in a table. And then they've also got a nice little graphing feature down below and a summary of the conditions. Um, and so this I think of as a regional tool because this is for the states in that southern region. Um, but just a, a nice example of different ways to display that data. 
um, and some of this is based off of ACES. And then also here is an example from the Drought Risk Atlas from the National Drought Mitigation Center. And what this does is help people make comparisons between droughts, um, or that's what the tool, the overarching goal of the whole tool is. Um, and in this example, uh, I've pulled data for a station in Nebraska. Um, it's got precipitation and temperature, and you can see they have that displayed as graphs. So just some examples of different ways to, to access ACES and display that in your websites. Now, there are other ways that you can interact with ACES. So let's say you're a fan of ACES climate summary maps, and we hope you are, and you would like to display those maps on your website. Well, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. You don't necessarily have to go and grab the data and make your own map. You could do what the folks up in South Dakota have done, and you could create a dashboard that will house all sorts of tools um, that you think is useful for um, the people of your state. So here you can see that there are several options to get information in this dashboard. And I have just chosen the standardized precipitation index as an example. And then you can get these maps that we create um, right here in their dashboard. And the cool thing is these are not static images. So no one is actually going in and updating these images on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. These are directly linked to our website. So as soon as our maps update, these maps will update. So in the next few slides, what I'm gonna do is show you how to do this. So how would you create your own dashboard? And here, uh, at the HPRCC, we even have our own dashboards. So for instance, um, this is a screenshot of our dashboard for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Um, and they wanted some information in a one-stop shop kind of location so that they could easily assess conditions um, there. And so you can see here, we've got a little insert from the South Dakota Mesonet, and we even have embedded our own maps into this tool. So, First, and now I, I should say, when I say step by step, this is very step by step. And I like that this is going to be recorded because if you're interested in doing this for your own site, you can come back to the video and you can go through this step by step on your own. So, first, what you're going to want to do is find the web address of the image that you're interested in. And so, in this example, what we're going to do is use an ACES climate summary maps. Um, and we will try to get the link to embed into our page. And so the first thing that you would do is you'd actually go to our ACES Climate Summary Maps page, and this is the link below. And then you would select the exact map that you're interested in. And so in this example, I have selected a year-to-date percent of normal map for the state of Tennessee. And so you can see here, that I have highlighted in this orange circle a link that says link to image here. And that is what you're going to be really interested in because if you just put the link, if you copy this image, put it in your website and put the link to the maps page, it's not going to do anything for you. You want the actual link for this specific map. So if you click on that link there, you will be taken to a screen that has only the map on the screen and it actually has the direct link to this map up here in the URL. Okay, so that's highlighted in the orange. So once you have this link, you can insert it into your HTML code. Now, you can see an example here. Now, of course, this is not all the code you would need to build your page, but this is the little snippet that you would want to include, okay? And so you see that this is the link to the image that was on the previous slide, okay? And now with just a few extra steps, you can actually add a link to the maps page if you want people to be able to click on the map itself, or you can even determine the size of your map, okay? So this right here is just linking to the maps page in general. This is embedding that specific map 
into your image, uh, into your page. And then this right here is just the size of your image. Okay, so very easy. You can actually copy and paste this code um, into a testing site um, if you if you want to test it out. So for instance, um, I don't write a lot of HTML code, but when I have in the past, I usually try to put it into a little um, editor so I can see what it is that I'm creating. And so if you're not as comfortable working with HTML, HTML code, that's okay because you can test it all out. So in this example, um, I've displayed the map for Tennessee using what's called um, this Try It Editor from W3 Schools. And this is the link to that Try It Editor. And so you can play around with formatting, size, you can get the design exactly how you want it before you embed it into your own page. Um, and so you can see here what I could do is I could change this link to Kentucky and then I would have a, you know, an image of Kentucky here. I could add multiple maps to it. I could put my maps in a table. I could add titles. Really, you can customize it any way that you want. But if you want to embed those um, maps into your page, this is a very easy way to do that. Um, so probably the best part about dashboards is that you can set it and forget it. So once you have your dashboard created, these maps will update on your page in real time, in perpetuity, or until the links change or the tools that you're linking to go down, okay? So as soon as our maps update, your maps will update. This keeps your pages refreshed. It keeps them up to date with little to no work once you have it all set up. And so I was gonna stop there and let Warren go to the advanced section, but he recommended that we do offer some best practices. Um, and so there are other ways that you can embed tools into your website, so you don't have to directly um, link to them, but we highly recommend that. Um, you could do something like utilize iframes to embed tools, but this can open up your website to some potential security risks, and we don't think that that's necessarily a good thing to do. So our recommendation is to embed your tools or images fully and try to avoid things like iframes. Um, but you can also provide links with descriptions. If, you, if embedding is not an option, um, you can provide screenshots for your users. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, and then also for those of you out there who are making content, so maybe you are not necessarily embedding other people's content, but you're the one that's making content for other people to potentially in, embed, try to find ways that make it easy for people to do that. Or you could work with others to help reference and link your tools. Um, working together on things like this can help build each other up, um, getting our tools out to lots of different folks, and it highlights all the great work that we're all doing in our community. So with that, um, this kind of concludes the basic ways that you can interact with ACES. And so I'm going to take a pause for any questions, and I will let Warren take it from here uh, once we address any of those. So thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, everybody well, should be unmuted. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, you can uh, use audio. Or if you don't have audio available or you're a little shy, uh, feel free to type anything in the message box, okay? <clears throat> Natalie, you must have done a great job. Maybe so. Well, uh, the good thing is, if you do have any questions that come up, just feel free to type them in the box. And we can also take questions at the end of the presentation. So um, we will, we can just move on if that's okay with Warren. Yeah, that sounds yeah, that's fine with me. All right, so I'm gonna be driving Warren's slides. So Warren, if I'm going too slow, you just tell me to move on. All right. 
So uh, dashboards, uh, they're pretty good, um, but sometimes uh, you need to go a little bit beyond a dashboard. Um, they're great for easy, low-cost methods of creating new uh, resources, but um, there's definitely ways to build up from a dashboard to uh, give you a more interactive experience, especially when you're looking for more specialized tools that maybe, maybe uh, SCASIS isn't creating a variable that you need then obviously you're going to need to develop something in-house or contract that work out to uh, get somebody to uh, develop that for you. Um, here we go. So uh, um, what, what I'm hoping is that for, if there's any programmers in the audience, that maybe these are some resources that will be pointed out to you that can help you deploy applications quicker without losing time uh, having to process data on site. Uh, maybe you've been directly downloading data from NCEI and instead of using a, a, web, a web service as a resource. Um, so ho hopefully you can uh, walk away with this with a couple of uh, ideas. Um, for project leads or probably uh, most of the scientists in the audience, um, if you're thinking about learning more about programming, then obviously I hope that you can use these resources to help you develop applications. Um, but at the same time, if you're never gonna touch any programming in your life, uh, the other thing that I uh, would help hope that you'd take away from this is maybe you can use these resources to help you direct your hiring decisions. So maybe you know that you want an ACES-based application in the future, but you have no idea what technologies are behind it. Um, so this will help you uh, get some uh, uh, a better idea of what goes into these web applications for your administrative duties. So just a quick, uh, I guess, kind of introduction to web programming uh, in a more detailed sense, but beyond just HTML. Um, we typically talk about uh, there being a client and a, and a server side or a front end and a back end. So on the client side or the front end are things that the user interacts with. So, I mean, for instance, you're looking at the GoToMeeting client right now, and all of this is running in your browser. So Google Chrome or Firefox is running GoToMeeting, and that is the client side or the front end. Now, on the server side or the back end, are things that uh, run on the server. And these can be activated by the user, but normally not interacted with, and that's for security reasons. So uh, using the GoToMeeting example, um, I'm talking into the mic, and then on it's the, my client is pro sending that audio to the GoToMeeting server, and then the server automatically knows to send that audio out to the rest of you. And that's happening on the server side, and all I can do is press mute or unmute to stop that from happening. So it's out of my control, and that's uh, for security. Most of the time, we're focusing on the front end when we're dealing with web applications. The back end is normally for things like data uh, data services, processing your data. Um, so when you're using pre-prepared data like ACES Web Services, you you have the opportunity to focus more on the front end, which has its benefits. Um, again, that can uh, mean quicker time to application deployment. So the uh, three big components for uh, building a web application are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So HTML or hypertext markup language is uh, what most people are familiar with, especially if you've uh, been around long enough to see uh, those older websites with uh, practically no, no color to them. You know, it, it looks, uh, I guess, worse than a newspaper. It's just uh, text on the screen. So HTML sets up your basic website structure and the content. So if you're linking to an ACES climate summary map, uh, that's happening in HTML, and all it's going to do is make an image appear on the screen. Now, bundled up with HTML is also CSS, or cascading style sheets. And this sets what we call the style of the website. Um, so basically, you're taking your plain, boring HTML, and you're uh, 
your setting background colors, you can adjust the font sizes. Um, basically, this is how you take your basic structure and turn it into something pretty. I mean, you can set the size of your ACES climate summary map, tell it to center itself, make sure that other maps are maybe in line. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with CSS. And ultimately, all of it's based around being able to adjust the way that your HTML looks. Now, this is all well and good for static content, but as I'm sure you know, uh, when you look at a service like uh, SCASIS, you're, you're clicking on stuff, you're interacting with stuff. There's just stuff happening everywhere. You're analyzing data and HTML can't do that. All it's doing is telling the browser to render content. It's a static, a static site. So how do we go from a static HTML site to a very dynamic web application? And that is where JavaScript comes in. That's a scripting language that sort of runs alongside HTML. So when your browser opens up your web page, it detects that there is JavaScript built into the page. And it'll run that. And that'll allow you to detect whether users are clicking on things. Um, it'll tell the website to update certain items. Um, you and then at the other side, and the, the uh, other thing it can do is help communicate to that other side of the web application on the server side. So I said before, the clients can't directly interact with server side scripts. So if you have a lot of data sitting back there, say you have a soil moisture data source back there, um, the only way you could access it is to use JavaScript to activate a server side script or maybe send information to the server side so that you can uh, get data from a database. Um, JavaScript is basically what makes web apps possible. It's just a, a web scripting language. Now, I did want to point out that JavaScript is actually unrelated to Java. So uh, if you're, uh, um, Java is a programming language more along the lines of C++, C. Um, it's a software development language, um, whereas JavaScript is a scripting language. Um, I'm not too sure the specifics of the story as to why uh, why they're so similarly named, but I can tell you that Java was developed by a different company than JavaScript. So what about the server side? Well, you can use all sorts of languages these days. Um, PHP is definitely the uh, older, more traditional language for uh, um, websites these days. There's been a huge movement towards uh, JavaScript-based server languages. Uh, that when you hear Node.js, um, that is JavaScript. You can also use Python. And, um, there's all sorts of languages coming out these days for uh, server-side languages. Um, if you're using a hosted environment that you're paying for, then chances are you're uh, using PHP. Um, and they all have their pluses and minuses. Um, but for basic web applications where you're interacting with external data sources, you may uh, need minimal involvement with these languages. Um, and generally, you use them when you're when you have local data on the server that you need to interact with or create. And there's a lot of challenges to building uh, larger web applications. Um, Learning modern web app languages takes time, especially when you're doing, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, folks in, in our community, you know, they have all sorts of responsibilities. With, uh, they're trying to get grants, conduct research, and learning a web language is, uh, frankly, uh, you know, it's it's not your job, so to say. Um, it's, it's difficult to find the time to uh, sit down and learn these things, especially when the environment's changing all the time. And then the other challenge is if actually hiring a programmer with the right balance of skills or maybe even hiring in the first place if funding's an issue. Now, it can be incredibly difficult to find the right programmer, um, especially when uh, the, uh, um, the corporate environment around uh, web programming doesn't really uh, fit in with the uh, the environment that we use in the uh, scientific area. So for instance, there's a lot of focus on uh, rapid app development using frameworks. And sometimes that doesn't fit in with uh, the scientific um, 
or the, the way that we build things in the scientific world, um, both because of our specific needs and because of the limited resources we can have sometimes. Uh, the, uh, but on the other side of things, we're lucky because the scientific community is pretty open. We've been very proactive about creating uh, web-based services to help reduce the workload um, when, when it comes to creating new web applications. So uh, now just a few examples of uh, things that you can do uh, moving past creating a static image dashboard. Um, I always consider WebGIS to sort of be the next step up. Um, you're using pre-generated products, so you don't actually have to calculate anything on your side necessarily. And then uh, WebGIS APIs are really easy to work with. And there's just tons of uh, resources out there since there's so many people using WebGIS applications like Google Maps, um, Bing Maps, OpenStreetMaps. Those are all examples of that. And uh, this is a screenshot of a, a project I did back in graduate school um, integrating USGS um, stations onto a uh, GIS map. And then you can see that I, um, so the station locations and uh, updated information were from a GIS source um, that I actually created, but still a GIS source, and uh, we're able to render the uh, graphs from the USGS. So it's a uh, sort of a mid-level entry point to working with data in the browser. Um, and we do offer uh, GIS services at HPRCC. Um, we recently released our GIS products and this uh, geo server. So using the geo server, you can actually directly integrate a website with our WFS services or uh, web web feature service. Um, I think got that acronym right. Uh, it's a uh, it's just a GIS protocol for getting data. So you use a, a link that you can get from the geo server to directly integrate GIS data into your GIS web application. Now, uh, sometimes pre-generated products just won't do. Like I said in the, uh, the soil moisture ex example, for instance, maybe uh, SCASIS just doesn't do a calculation that you need to do. And uh, that's where uh, GIS and pre-generated products really aren't gonna, gonna fill the gap. So programmers will need to access data quickly, but uh, also need to be able to do these calculations and generate displays. And this is where data web services can help save time by shifting your focus onto the product or these special calculations that you need to do rather than the data. And ASIS Web Services is a good example of this. Um, you can access it using simple URL calls and many of the parameters that you might need can actually be calculated by the web service. So as an example, uh, it'll do departures from normal for you automatically if you tell it to. Um, you can also do various degree day calculations. Um, there's a few other things that uh, you can calculate on the fly using that too. So that can help uh, save time and reduce uh, uh, reduce the amount of time that you're hunting down bugs in your web applications. And again, folk, uh, turn your attention back to the, uh, the actual product that you're making. Uh, ASUS Web Services returns a simple JSON string and it's uh, that that's just a integral part of JavaScript, so it's easily incorporated incorporated into your JavaScript applications that you're creating. Now, this is an example of a ASUS Web Services query. Um, so you can use an AJAX call in ASUS Web Services, and uh, AJAX calls are uh, just a way for you to uh, send strings to URLs and expect a response back. So this is an example from the ASUS Builder where you can test uh, request strings, and we'll have a little link to that in the next slide. Um, you can see that I've there is a parameter JSON string. So we have a station ID, a starting date, end date, and then a list of elements or variables. So in the elements array there, we have uh, average temperature, the daily average temperature. 
So we should expect the Lincoln Airport for January 1st, 2019, and the average daily temperature for that day. And the string it returns is below that, and you can see we get some metadata, which is great for plotting, for instance, if you wanted to plot that on a, on a GIS application. Um, or help uh, if you're doing uh, other chart products, you can use that to help fill in your uh, chart title. And then we get exactly what we called for in the data array there. You, you get January 1st, and the average temperature was a warm 10 degrees in Lincoln, Nebraska. So it's, uh, with ASIS Web Services, you're able to shift away from handling your own data processing on the back in the back end, um, maybe using a traditional setting where you're downloading data from NCEI directly, maybe, um, and it just all of a sudden you need to create an entire data processing framework in the background just to get raw numbers for you to do calculations off of. And ASIS Web Services cuts that out of the equation. This is the uh, RCC ASIS Builder. Uh, it's a fantastic resource if you're developing web applications off of ASIS Web Services. Um, you go in there, you it'll help kind of walk you through making a uh, parameter string and then show you what you should expect from it. So if you're doing, if you're trying to debug why you're not getting exactly the sort of thing that you want back from ASIS Web Services, or you're trying to figure out uh, what call you should be sending in the first place or how to build your calls. Uh, it's just a fantastic resource for uh, for building those. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the other resource that goes hand in hand with that is the actual documentation. Uh, that's also pretty clearly laid out for, uh, for developing strings. And this is just a list of tools that are using ASUS Web Services. There's there's a lot out there. Um, most of them are based on uh, JavaScript, as I said before. And uh, I guess I didn't mention you don't have to uh, use JavaScript to access ASUS data. If you go to the documentation page, there's actually ways for you to create a static URL to get that data. And uh, my understanding is that they're uh, continuing to work on ways of getting images straight back from ASUS Web Services too. So theoretically, you'd be able to, uh, in the same way that Natalie was showing earlier, embed images directly from ASUS Web Services that incorporate um, this uh, updating data source. Um, so I hope everybody uh, got something from our uh, our uh, introduction to some more advanced uh, uses for uh, ASUS Web Services and uh, just developing web tools in the first place. Um, I realize it might have been a, uh, a kind of shallow introduction, but this is a, one of those topics that we could just spend days talking about. And I think we have, most, most of the time, our ASUS Web Service workshops are, are uh, at least a day long. But hope, hopefully this at least uh, gets the ball rolling maybe for you. And uh, I know for web developers, uh, maybe if you hadn't heard of where these resources were to use these data sources, maybe that'll uh, help you hit the ground running. Well, I guess we're going to open the floor to questions now. OK, thanks a lot. Well, um, this is. Becky Bollinger in the Colorado Climate Center. Can I ask a question? Sure. All right. Um, I don't know if you guys have um, resources you could provide online or if we should email directly with questions on things like when, um, when you do those um, ACES calls and you get back JSON data, that is um, really easy to break down using JavaScript, but JSON is like a nightmare. I feel like breaking it down in another programming language. I'm not very familiar with Python, um, so I I generally use Python to kind of grab the data, and then I go to a um, a language that I'm more comfortable with, which is R. But it always seems like if I'm not directly in JavaScript, it's really hard to break down 
um, that JSON formatting. Do you have recommendations on that? Um, so if you're using Python to uh, break down uh, or to at least make the initial call, you can at least uh, convert the JSON string into a Python dictionary. Um, and that can at least take away that part of uh, parsing it. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a, I, I assume there's a library for most languages for parsing JSON data. And I'm trying to uh, open up my GitHub page now because we do use a uh, Python. We, we use Python to process our ACES climate summary maps. So we should have a uh, example of um, how that works. And also uh, we wrote a, uh, um, a Python kind of handler for uh, the Unidata Siphon project, uh, Siphon, that helps to uh, simplify the process of acquiring data from ACES. So if you're using Python, that's another resource that you can use to uh, sort of direct your, I, I guess, if, if you're spending a lot of time figuring out how to connect, for instance, that can help, uh, help with that. Um, I seem to be having an issue making connection to my browser right now. Um, but I'll, I will type in the chat the name of the package we use for Python for processing that once I get to GitHub. OK. Yeah, I'm not sure why my browser I'm connected to GoToMeeting, but apparently the rest of me is not connected to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then one more question, um, why I'll have you is, um, do you guys offer like really advanced workshops for ACES or? Um, so I, 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 I'm pretty sure we do. I'm not sure on the, the precedence of it since I haven't actually uh, been a part of one of those workshops myself yet. Maybe Natalie has the better answer. Yeah, so I know that in the past there have been some workshops. So several several years ago, the Northeast Regional Climate Center brought folks in to Ithaca to do a multi-day workshop, if I remember right. And there have been some kind of one-day workshops here and there. So I would say if you're interested and other folks are too, please let us know because then we can work together to try to get something set up. Um, you know, because I think that that could be really beneficial to folks. So yeah, so if anybody is listening out there that also wants a real hands-on, deep experience, yeah, let us know. Well, I'm first to say I'm interested. <laughs> Sounds good. There any more questions? Okay, I think that might be about it. Uh, last good chance to ask a question. Going once, twice. Okay, I think that's probably it. Um, Warren, if they have anything else they didn't want to ask in front of the group, uh, they could probably just email you at your address right there, correct? Uh, yep, certainly can. Okay, well, that sounds like a good deal. And at this point... Um, just one second. Oh, I do have an answer for uh, uh, 
Oh, was that uh, Becky? Becky that asked about the Python. Yeah. Uh, process. So I'm I'm looking at the code from uh, the function we wrote for the Siphon library, and we use um, requests to send the request to uh, ASUS Web Services. And you can turn the response or process the JSON from the response by running a method on the response called JSON. So uh, what that means is that with the uh, with the siphon library, if you use that to make a request, it'll return a dictionary because it uses the request library ability to parse the JSON string. Okay. So I I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'll look into it. Thank you. All right. No problem. Well, Natalie and Warren, thank you so much. We really appreciate you uh, giving this intro. Um, I think it'd be interesting to maybe do something a little bit more in depth uh, subsequently and, and, and maybe in this forum or another one, whatever would be most appropriate. Uh, for everybody that is still with us right now, thank you so much for attending. Um, as it says on the slide there, uh, there will be a copy of this on the uh, AASC YouTube channel. Um, and then I'm going to send out a uh, email over the listserv with a link to that channel. Ironically, we don't have millions of viewers subscribed to it, so it's kind of hard to find. And um, I believe we'll get a PDF of these slides as well, and I will go ahead and include that in the email. Or you can go to the AASC website, and there will be a link for all of this stuff too. So uh, with that being said, I'll thank everybody for attending. And uh, Natalie and Warren, thank you again for presenting. And uh, that's it for today. So go out and have a wonderful day. Hope to see you at the annual meeting in June. All right. Thanks a lot, Warren. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you, Natalie.